Chapter 3 is basically the backstory, it's the backdrop. Chapter 3 is the setup for 4. 4 is where we're going. Um, all we're going to do today is a quick tour of the Old Testament. We're going to tie it to the book of Revelation, mix in some New Testament, package the whole thing up and give it to you, okay? So basically just going to cover the whole Bible today. It shouldn't take very long. Enjoy. Joshua chapter 3. Then, somebody say then. Amen. Then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. He and all the children of Israel, and they lodged there before they crossed over. They're on the eastern side of the Jordan River. They've come through the wilderness of sin. They have left Egypt. They've been on this long wilderness journey, literally through the wilderness of sin. That's not figurative. That's the actual Bible name. They came through the wilderness of sin. They've come to the Jordan River. They're getting ready to cross over the Jordan River and move into the dwelling in the promised places of God. But as we discussed last week, the Jordan River represents all the overwhelming stuff of this world that comes at us. It is all the distractions, all the pressures, all of the nonsense, all of the, the junk, the strife, the evil, the wickedness. Um, that is the Jordan River. And, and as we discussed last week, the people of God always crossed the Jordan River when it was overflowing. They never did it when it was low, when the water was low, when there was, it was always when it was overflowing its banks. God calls you to cross over into the promises that he has called you to at the moment that life is overwhelming, overflowing, and seems like, oh my, this, I'm going to drown. That's the moment that God calls you to cross over. Amen? So it was, verse 2, after three days that the officers went through the camp, they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, the ark of the covenant represents the presence of God. Say presence of God. Anytime, every time that you read the ark of God, just think about the presence, okay? Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. New Testament's the Old Testament revealed. It's a type and a shadow. It's pointing us towards something. When you see the ark of the covenant, the presence of the Lord your God, and the priest and the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. If you don't hear anything else out of today, if the only thing you carry away is that when you see the presence of God, go after it. Amen? Say that with me. Say, go after the presence of God. We are a people called to go after the presence of God. Israel always, it just represents the people of God. And Israel in the Old Testament is the people of God. You and I are the people of God. So this message is to us. It's for us. Hmm. Wow, I've got to move fast. Um, bearing it. Then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Go after the presence of God. Yet there shall be a space between you and it. Mm, it's Old Testament, there's a space. In the New Testament, there's no space between us and the presence of God. Jesus Christ removed the space. Amen? Amen. 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 There shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know by the way which you must go, for if you have not passed this way before. Okay? One thing to know about the presence of God is you are to go after the presence of God. You are to be with the presence of God. But make sure you stay with the presence of God so you stay your way. Because the moment that you get ahead of the presence of God, you might get lost. Amen? You are to travel with the presence of God. God's presence is leading you, guiding you. I know there's a slight temptation in us to want to guide God's presence to the things that we want. We want to lead God's presence into the things that we've mapped out, the scripts that we have written. But, but, but. Well, the reason they call him God is because he gets to make those decisions and we don't. Uh, he's, he, it's, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. Sanctification is that next step. Sanctification is that setting apart, that making holy. There is consecration, which is done in the blood of Jesus Christ. And then there is sanctification, which is the ongoing work. Sanctification is that ongoing work of holiness and conformity to the will and the purposes of God. Sanctify yourselves. Let's, let's put it this way. Position yourselves. We've said it throughout this series. We must be properly positioned to walk in the blessings of God. Joshua is saying to the people, sanctify yourselves. Position yourselves to walk into the blessing because it is time to cross over into the promises. Oh, I wish there was a people that were ready to step over into the promises of God. Amen? Amen. <sighs> sanctify yourselves. Position yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. The church is crying out for wonders. People are crying out for signs, wonders. They want to see the power of God. They want to see the movement of God. 
Position yourself and you will see the works of God. Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, take up the ark of the covenant, take up the presence of God and cross over before the people. So they took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priest to bear the ark of the covenant saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua, come on iPad, stay with me. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. When you get ready to cross over, those overwhelming circumstances of life, those things that are overflowing the banks of the river, those things that are overwhelming you, those things that you think that you will never get over, those things that you think are gonna drown you, the things that you think are holding you back from the promises of God. Come on, somebody. Those things that you think are holding you back from walking in the promises of God, know that the presence of God is gonna wade into that circumstance before you. The presence of God is going before you and, and will clear up all of the issues that you may walk in the promises of God. It is not dependent upon your labor, upon your effort. It is not dependent upon you. It is dependent upon his presence. The, the presence in the presence of God has found all of the answers to all of the issues of life. Right. Hallelujah. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. Say 12 men. 12 men. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soul, as soon as the souls of the feet of the priest who bear the ark of, mm, as soon as the souls of the feet of the people, the people who bear the presence of the Lord. You and I are a New Testament generation. Through the mouth of Peter, the Holy Spirit has told us that we are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. You and I are the priests who are called to carry the presence of God. We are told that the presence of God dwells within us. Come on, I hope you can do the math this morning. Therefore, it shall come to pass as soon as the souls of the royal priest who bear the presence of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, as soon as they rest in the waters of the Jordan, when are you going to know that the moment that you step into your issues with the presence of God, your issues are going to stem and run away? Oh, come on, somebody. you got to step in there with the presence of God. You've got to step in with faith. See, see, it says right there. It says it. it. I love it when the Bible actually says what we want to believe. The Lord of all the earth, you shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, that the waters that come down from upstream, they shall stand as a heap. Those waters of the Jordan River, all of that stuff that is flowing out of the world, all of those overwhelming circumstances, all of that stuff that is overflowing the bank, when you step into those circumstances with the presence of God, oh, they will stem. Not only will they stem, but they will be backed up. How far will they be backed up? We're going to find out all the way to the city of Adam. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with a priest bearing the presence of the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came into the Jordan and the feet of the priest who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its bank during the whole time of harvest, it's harvest time, it's overflowing, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still, they rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan. When Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Grace because they had partaken of sin, excuse me, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, maybe that was a proverbial slip for somebody. Uh, when they were expelled from the Garden of Eden, they, 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 they moved out and moved into the city of Adam. The city of Adam is up at the headwaters of the Jordan River. It is the, the, the Jordan River finds its wellspring, its source in Mount Hermon. The water comes down, flows through the city of Adam. It forms the headwaters and it forms this Jordan River, which, by the way, flows all the way down into the Dead Sea. So if, if you needed any confirmation that the Jordan River represents the overwhelming circumstances of this life, the Jordan River ends in the Dead Sea. You know why it's called the Dead Sea? 
because nothing lives in it. There is no life there. All of those overwhelming circumstances, all of those situations and circumstances of the world that seek to overwhelm you, to drown you, there is no life in them. And where they accumulate, there is no life. Life is found in the presence. And in the presence of God, all of those overwhelming circumstances, they are arrested. And in fact, they are sent back to where they came. Notice what it says. It doesn't say that the water just stopped. It's not like the crossing of the Red Sea where the water just stopped and walled up on either side of them. Not only did the water stop, but it retreated. They're all the way down south. They're down here in near, near Gideon. They're near Gilgal. And the water literally recedes. It goes all the way back up to the city of Adam. God has not just come to stop the issues of your life, but the presence of God has come to send them back to the place from which they came. All that hell is thrown at you, it's not just to be arrested, but it is to be sent back to the place from which it came. Mm. And this is just the setup. This is just the foundation. The good stuff's coming. That the waters which came from da- upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down to the Sea of Arabath, the Salt Sea, that's the Dead Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground. Oh, that's a word for somebody right there. They stood firm on dry ground. You're looking at the Jordan River. You're looking at the circumstances of life. You believe the banks are overflowing. The river is overflowing. You believe you're going to drown. And when you step into those circumstances with the presence of God, suddenly you find yourself standing firm on dry ground. Translation, you're standing on a solid rock. Amen? In fact, we know there was rock. We're getting ready to find out there's rock in that riverbed. You are standing firm on dry ground. The priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Look at your neighbor and say, that was quick. Foundation's done. Now we can start the message. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Joshua chapter 4, verse 1. And it came to pass when all the people of Israel, somebody, you didn't get it. When all the people of Israel, when all the people of Israel, when all of the children of God had crossed over, when all of the children of God, not, not just some of the special ones, Not just some of the pretty ones, not just the ones we like, not just the ones we agree, oh, not just the ones we agree with. When all the people of God had completely crossed over the Jordan River, then the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from every tribe, take a representative of every nation. Take a representative of every nation. The 12 tribes represent the nations. Take a representative from every tribe, from every nation, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, and place from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Get it now. Joshua. God's man. Joshua is, is, a, is, is a shadow. He is an image. He is, he is the, the express image of the prophecy of Jesus Christ to come. Joshua says to them, get 12 men. One man that represents every nation. And in the midst of that river, in the midst of those overwhelming circumstances, those things, that, 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 the, 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 the thing that is intended to defeat you, the thing that is intended to keep you from walking in the promises of God, go into that very place and get a, a memorial stone out of the very depths, the very midst of that circumstance. Pick it up and carry it with you into the place of promise. You got the image? The, the presence of God goes in. The issues of life are stemmed. Then they go into the very place. See, you and I are conditioned, we are trained, and we have taught ourselves to run from the very circumstances of life. You and I have conditioned and trained ourselves, and the world has indicated to us that 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 when we get the least bit of victory from that thing that was sent to undo us, to keep us from the promises, to run from it to hide it, to put on a church face, come on somebody, to put on a church face and deny it ever happened, to, to be somebody other than who you were. But, but, but no, we're, we're to go into that very place, it's in the very midst, we're not to run from it, but we're to grab that stone and carry it into the promises that there will be a memorial, there will be a testimony. 
Then Joshua called the 12 men, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. One stone for every nation, one representative, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask, when your descendants ask in a time to coming, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Very soon, you're going to find that these stones were used to create an altar experience, a place of worship. And we've been talking about the altar experience. We've been talking about the worship. But we're going to define the altar today, and, and it's, going to, it's going to be different than what you've believed that it was. The altar doesn't look like you thought the altar looked. And, 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 and you're getting ready to see that. But he says, he says, what do these stones mean, those descendants, those that follow you? And we're not just talking about your biological children. We're talking about your spiritual sons and daughters, the disciples, those that you're mentoring, those that are looking to you, those that you're helping to feed, those that you're leading into the things of God. Verse 7, then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When they see your testimony... When they see the memorial in your life of what God has done and they ask you, how did this happen? You were to tell them the presence of God was with me in my very darkest place, in my very deepest place. It was the presence of God. It was not my church attendance. It was not my giving record. It was not, not my Sunday school attendance. It was the presence of God. Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan, the overwhelming circumstances of life, were cut off because of the presence of God. And when it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel. They shall be a reminder to the people of God forever. Somebody say forever. forever. And the children of Israel did so. Well, there's a novel concept. The people of God did what they were told to do. It happens occasionally. And the children of God did so just as Joshua commanded. They took up 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan. Please don't miss the fact that they didn't go find them in the promised land. They didn't find them in the easy place. They found them in the deepest, darkest, most difficult, the very depths of that which is sent to destroy them is the place that they found the memorial of their testimony. It is that darkest moment of your life that God wants to use to memorialize his greatest victory. Come on, somebody. Wish y'all were, oh, come on. So the priest bore the ark of, the priest who bore the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people hurried and crossed over. Then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over that the ark of the Lord and the priest crossed over in the presence of the people. And the men of Reuben, the men of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. If you want to know about Reuben and you want to know about Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh, just go online and watch last week's message. Amen? If I re-preach all of that this week, we won't re-preach all of this this week. Amen? So we got to get this done. This is this week's word. That was last week's word. So verse 13, about 40,000 prepared for war. They crossed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priest who bear the ark of the testimony of God to come up from the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priest, saying, Come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priest who bore the ark of the covenant... <sighs> And it came to pass when the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet touched dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. They're out of the river, they're back on the side. Verse 19. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Say Gilgal. Gilgal. It's going to have meaning in a moment. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. There were 12 stones, 12 stones that came out of that deepest, darkest, overwhelming thing, the thing that was intended for the undoing. There were 12 stones that were taken out of that river and they were brought to Gilgal. Verse 21. 
Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children knowing Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. That which has been will be. That which is follows is always greater than that which was. It's not in the text. I just added that if you're reading along. That all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Your testimony is that all people may know the Lord your God. Because of the presence of God in your life, because you are cultivating the intimacy of a relationship with him, because you are worshiping at the altar, you are creating the altar experience, you are placing yourself on that altar in worship and sacrifice and surrender. The presence of God, the habitation of God is with us. It is not a place of visitation, but a place of habitation. And then the world and the descendants shall look in and see what God has done because of the presence of God. And they will then know God and fear him which means they will respect him, they will reverence him because they will see what he has done in our lives. Praise God. Okay, so if you want to have fun, watch Joel light up because he's getting ready to light up because we're getting ready to talk about the Nephilim and, and the Raphaim. And every time we do, Joel gets excited. It's, it's, it's like, okay, amen. So, so you're with me, right? That, 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 they, they, they've gotten these 12 stones, and after this victory, after crossing over, they've arranged these stones. Some of you are probably going, well, they built an altar with them, right? And so you're picturing them stacking 12 stones up and making this nice altar, right? Here's the problem. Gilgal basically means a circle of stones. You see... Those 12 stones were not stacked one on each other or in a nice brick pattern. They weren't stacked in a square. They were set in a circle. 12 stones in a circle. Now, just because I enjoy the curiosity and the foolishness of the world, and, and, and it's fun to laugh at the enemy. Amen? How many know it's fun to laugh at the enemy? Um, there is a place in Gilgal called Gilgal Rephaim. Gilgal Rephaim. And coincidentally, it's a lot of stones. It's over 40,000 stones. And, well, coincident, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, they're arranged in a circle. They're arranged in a circle on a high place. Notice. Notice that Joshua, the image of Jesus, he got his memorial in the low place. Oh, come on, somebody. Joshua takes the men of the nation and goes into the lowest place of the circumstances to build his memorial. This memorial, this temple is built on a high place. One is in humility. One is in pride. Come on. Gilgal Rephaim. It was a celestial site. It was a celestial site for worship of the summer solace. The summer solstice. The, the, the sun god. The other light that they worshipped in the land. The annual celebration. This, this circle of stones. Not 12 stones, but 40,000 stones. Massive, overwhelming thing that was built in this high place. It was a celestial observatory. It was a celestial observatory to absorb and observe the astronomical stuff. It was to check out the constellations, the astronomy, the astrology. It was a cultic center. And coincidentally, Many believe that it may very well have been the burial site of Og, King Og, King of Sihon, the giant, the giant that was in the land, King Og. We spoke of King Og last week. King Og was eventually slain by Moses. Um, 
can't prove it to you from the Bible necessarily, exactly, totally, but there's some things that are speculated. And, and, and one of the things that's curious and it's interesting is that we find that, that there's, it, it, it's very possible that, that King Og was a problem for Noah, was a problem for Abraham, and was a problem, well, for Joshua, or for Moses. He was defeated by Moses, not a problem for Joshua. So it's interesting that this rumored burial site, this potential burial site of, of King Og, who was a giant, who was a Nephilim. Nephilim, by the way, means the fallen. Nephilim means the fallen. Um, this is for those of you that speculate and, 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 and read into Genesis um, chapter 6 that, that indeed perhaps um, the giants of the land were the result of fallen angels having intercourse with human women in producing this race, this race of giants on the land. And so King Og, so I find it interesting that in the place that God has his people step over into promise and build 12 circular stones as a memorial to the goodness of God, that we find this other circular site with 40,000 stones on a high place used for worshiping things that are pretty much everything except the true and living God. Again, probably just a coincidence, just one of those things. But it's also interesting that this Gilgal Raphaim is near Shiloh, which is the first place where the wilderness tabernacle rested, the presence of God, the worship of God. It's also near Bethel the place where Jacob's ladder was, the place that heaven touched earth and earth was joined to heaven. So here in the midst of, of where heaven is coming and going, here in the midst of where the presence of God is, there's this other circular structure that has been built and intended. Um, I wanna read with you for just a moment. Uh, we're gonna roll back to Genesis and I just, um, we're laying foundation, we're going somewhere. Stay with me, I know it's a lot of word. Verse 1, Genesis 6. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. The sons of God here is referring, I believe, to the angels, the created angels, in this case the fallen angels. Because once they leave their holy habitation in heaven and interact with flesh on this earth, they've crossed a boundary. But they saw that the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and I think the implication is that there was pleasure, and they took for themselves wives of all whom they chose. Verse three, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he's indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Verse four, there were giants on the earth in those days, okay? There's no debating for us that there were giants on the earth because the Bible says so. We don't have to worry about what pictures have been faked on the internet. We just know that the Bible says there were giants on the earth. And also afterward, the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thought of his heart was evil only continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Did you catch that? There were giants, verse 4, there were giants in the land in those days. So there was giants before the flood. They were in the earth. And notice these three words, which are easy for us to overlook. Verse 4, Genesis 6, 4. And also afterwards. Also after, what do you mean afterwards? Oh, after the flood. There were giants in the land before the flood. Now, Genesis chapter 7, verse 6, tells us, well, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 4, tells us 
For after seven days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made, says God. He's going to destroy with a flood all the things that he has made. Verse 21. And all flesh died that moved on all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. King Og was a giant. Got it? Did you catch it? Verse 6. There were giants in the earth in those days before the flood, and then also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore children to them. These supernatural beings. Now, again, I just get so tickled. If you look around, you find all kinds of things. There's all these rumors of like extraterrestrial beings, something from outer space coming. See, Gilgal Raphaim, it's the Stonehenge of the Middle East. It's this circular monument of stones, and there's 40,000 stones, and it's this massive, you have to have an aerial view to even see it. It almost looks like a corn maze that's set out there in stones. At the very middle is this tomb, which they suspect was eventually the tomb of Og, but it was for celestial observation, celestial worship. It, it was all of this other than God stuff, the very center. And then there's all these rumors about, well, extraterrestrials built it, things from outer space. And extraterrestrials had this hand in, in humanity and technology, and, and it wasn't God, it was extraterrestrials. You know, all that junk actually fits together. And the hilarious part is they're actually not that far off. This was built by stuff that was from out of this world and wasn't intended to be in this world, stuff that came to visit, it just didn't come in a flying saucer. Amen? It was the Nephilim, the fallen, the fallen angels. Satan fell from heaven like lightning, and a third of the angels he took with him. You know the good news? If he took a third with him, guess how many are left? Two-thirds are still in heaven. Two-thirds are still on our side. I'll take two-thirds over one-third any day. Amen. When he's talking about good stuff. Come on. So, big deal, Pastor Ed. Now we've got a bunch of rocks in a circle in the middle of Gilgal in the Holy Land. Hmm. Revelation chapter 4. Don't worry. We're only doing every other chapter of every other book today. It'll be fine. You'll be out of here in plenty of time for lunch next Sunday. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. How many want an open door in heaven? Behold, I looked, and a door was standing open in heaven. The first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He who sat there was like Jasper and a Sardis stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were... 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits assigned to seven altars, assigned to seven mountains. Go back a couple of weeks, it's online, you'll be up to speed. So, did you get it? There were 24 who were arranged, may I dare say, in a circle around the throne. Mm. It's fixing to come together. You see, the altar is not created for God to be on the altar. God's been on the altar. And I got news for you, he's not still on the altar. His work is finished. Jesus had his altar moment. Jesus had his place on the altar. He spent his time on the altar, but it is finished. He is no longer on the altar. He is on the throne. We now construct altars around the throne. The altar is a place of encountering the throne of God. It is the place of worship. The 24 that are around the throne represent the 12 nations of the Old Testament. They represent the 12 apostles, which represent the 12 nations of the New Testament. There are now 24 
four, the former and the latter. There is a completion of all things. All, there are 24 altars around that throne. The altar has become a throne place. Oh, when you get this, when the pieces come together, it's going to rock your world. You see, this is an image, even what is here in Gilgal now, it is an image of the altar experience. The altar is created. They are individual altars. You and I have been conditioned in our mind to believe that we are to build one pile of stones, one altar, and, and that is where the sacrifice goes. But you and I are called to individually build altars, and individually we collectively form the presence of worship around the throne. You need to stop looking for somebody else to create a worship experience for you. You need to stop looking for someone else to build an altar, to build a pile of stones, and you can just stop by and kneel there. Every one of us is created and called to build an altar of worship. We are each called individually to an altar experience, to a worship experience, to a place of self-surrender, to a place of intimacy, to a place of, of, of just absolutely freaked out God worship. We are to let loose, completely surrendering, worshiping God with all of our heart, soul, and mind in truth and spirit. We are called to individual worship. And as we surround him, his throne is there. Amen. 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 Come on. Mm. Oh, cool. And the Bible says it too. Um, verse 6. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and all around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. When you read the book of Revelation, whenever you see the word eyes, say believer. The believers, the saints, are referred to in the book of Revelation as the eyes. Those that are lost, you'll read later, they're referred to as the sea. The sea is referred to the lost humanity that is outside of Christ. That is why the Antichrist rises up out of the sea. The Antichrist is a man that comes out of the unbelievers. But the eyes, those that have eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to receive what the Spirit is saying. The eyes in the book of Revelation are those who are saved. They are the saints. They are you and me in the kingdom of heaven seated around the throne. There were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature like a lion, the second like a calf, third like a face of a man, the fourth like a flying eagle. All I have to do is share with you Ezekiel and part of uh, some of the other books. And, you know, like we do like, I don't know, about two or three more books of the Bible and you'll understand all that, but we probably should do that a different day. Verse seven, the first living creature, we have the descriptions, the four living creatures, verse eight, each having six wings full of eyes around and within, and they did not rest day or night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is and is to come. Say Jesus. Okay, just in case you were wondering, we're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the one sitting on the throne. Verse 9, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by you they exist and were created. All things were created by you and for you and through you and all things consist and exist for you. This is Colossians and this is John 1. This is Jesus. He's on the throne. And by the way, I, 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 I want to make sure that we know something. When the Bible says to us nations, it's not referring to geographical borders. It's not, it, it, it's not a geographically bordered nation like Mexico, like Canada, like Uganda, like the Philippines. A nation in the Bible is a people group. It's a social group. It's a political group. It's a lifestyle group. It's a belief group. It's, it's hobby. It's, it, it, it's people who have a belief or a habit or a structure or a life thing that, 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 that unifies them. Sometimes they are generally bounded by a geographic region, but a nation in the Bible is not a geographic nation. It is a people group. So when the Bible says that out of every tongue, tribe, and nation, oh, come on, somebody. When the Bible says out of every tongue, tribe, and nation, they are seated around, oh, this is going to wreck somebody's religious belief system. There will be people out of every nation worshiping around the throne of God. 
but, 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 but religiously, there's some people I don't like. Religiously, there's some people I don't agree with. I, I'm sorry to upset you, but the Bible says that there will people that come to salvation, that worship in heaven, in the throne of God, out of every tongue, tribe, and nation. You need to put more faith in the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. Yes, there must be redemption. There must be salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. We find repentance and we find transformation. But out of every tongue, tribe, and nation, out of every people group, there will be people gathered around the throne of God. Get rid of the notion that they can't go to heaven and they can't go to heaven and they can't go to heaven because I don't like them. I don't like the way they look. I don't like the way they act. I don't like the way they talk. Stop being a religious bigot and understand that God's redemptive power will reach into every people group, every tongue, every tribe. When will you start acting more like Father? When will you start believing with the faith of God that we are called to reach everyone? Everyone. Everyone. The 24 elders represent the 24 heads of the nations. They represent all people. There's no one left out of this equation. The 12 tribes of Israel, there were 12 men that were selected as representatives to grab a stone. Every one of them had a rock. There, oh, come on, somebody. There was a rock that was available. There was an altar that was available for every nation. Every person can come to the rock. Every person out of every people group, out of every nation, out of every tongue can find salvation in Jesus Christ. But you got to be at the right altar. You can't be at the big fake one with all the stones in the middle of a fake high place. Get away from the idols. Get away from the worldviews. Get away from the astrology and the cosmic stuff and the aliens and the UFOs and the philosophies and, and all of that vein. Jesus. Jesus. It is his throne. Colossians chapter 1. Believe it or not, we're a lot closer to being done than you think. Mm. Colossians chapter, well done today for this moment. We've got more to go. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 through 18. Hmm. He, say Jesus. Jesus. He, Jesus, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Father, through the blood of Jesus Christ, Father, through the King Jesus, through the Lord Jesus, Father is translated, He has legally purchased us out of the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. You and I are legally brought out of Gilgal Raphaim and we are literally brought in to the circle of God, the altar experience around the throne of God, the place of worship. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all of creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. In all things he is supreme. Say with me, Jesus is above all. Jesus is the supreme power. Oh my gosh, you all are so excited. Jesus is the supreme power. Jesus is the supreme authority. Brainwashing, 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 brainwashing. Jesus is the supreme authority. Not because we're brainwashing you, just because it's true. But if you're going to be brainwashed, be brainwashed with the truth. Amen? Come on. Verse 26, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Oh, what is the mystery that has been hidden for generations and ages all the way through the Old Testament? Verse 27, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. By the way, verse 2 now, chapter 2, verse 15, mm, this is one of my favorite places. Having disarmed, meaning Jesus, and what he was done, 
I'm going to read the whole thing, but it talks about, about the work of the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them in it. Some of you are just too nice in your Christian faith. Jesus is our example. Jesus was not nice to the wicked principalities and powers. Jesus was not nice to the demonic angels. In fact, it says that he made an open public, he disarmed them, he mocked them, he disgraced them, he did it publicly. And listen, he only humiliated people publicly if they were super religious, okay? But he had no problem publicly humiliating the principalities and powers behind the force of darkness. That which is perpetrating evil. Our war is not with flesh and blood. Our war is not against people. It is against the evil that is seeking to drive people. That is what we war against. And it's okay to make a public show, a public declaration of their defeat. Okay. All of this that we've shared, all that we've discussed, is essentially foundational to this singular point that we're getting ready to make. We're going to Colossians chapter 2. Excuse me, I'm sorry. We're going to Ephesians chapter 2. Everything you've read, you've been given all the pieces, all the background, all the backstory. You understand now. Circular stones. Altars of worship around the throne. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the curses of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, the fulfilling of desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. We all started in the same place. But God... Say, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ in the midst of our sin. That whole notion that people better get their stuff together so they can come to church and sit in God's presence? Got a little Bible problem with that. While we were in the midst of our mess, even dead in our trespasses, God came through his work, through his altar experience, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. Jesus had his altar experience while you and I were in the middle of our lostness so that you and I can have an altar experience and be in his presence. Verse 6. Hmm. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, say it with me, for good works. You were created for the good works of God, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. All of that was to make this point. Can we go back to 2.6? And just put 2.6 up there. Made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I want to give you a nugget of revelation. If you read the original language, the word places is not there. The people who were kind and gracious enough to translate our Bible into English language did a nice job. But many of them, most of them, didn't know God the way that you now know God, just even right here in this moment. And so for our convenience of understanding, they inserted the word places. Because for them, it seems the notion of actually being seated in heavenly 
in Jesus Christ was a little much. They just wanted their own throne next to Jesus. But what the scripture says is that we are seated together in the heavenly in Christ Jesus. The heavenly in this case is the third heaven. We have three heavens. The first heaven is the earth that you and I walk around on and the atmosphere that we see. The second heaven is everything that is outside of the atmosphere that we breathe, including that which we can't see. It's that place where the natural crosses over and the supernatural, there's this buffer. It's what some of us would call outer space. It's where the sun, moon, and stars are. And somewhere above that is the third heaven. It is the holy habitation of God. It is the place where God's throne currently is in the heavenly realm. But the word of God tells us that everything in the heavenly realm has been delivered to us who are in Christ Jesus. And it furthermore goes on to tell us that you and I are now sitting in that heavenly place. But we are not just sitting in that heavenly place, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. Did we not read just a minute ago the mystery that was concealed for so long is Christ in us and us in Christ? If you have not got intimately acquainted with Colossians and Ephesians, you need to do so. Colossians will tell you who Jesus is at a whole nother level, and Ephesians will tell you who you are in Jesus and who Jesus is in you. Every believer should leave this earth with a thorough understanding of Colossians and Ephesians. If you do, you'll have a much better life while you're living here. Do you understand? Let's do the math. We've shared all of this this morning to come to this singular point. We're narrowing, 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 and here it is. Here's the nugget of revelation that you were to hide in your heart and carry with you for the rest of your days. If Jesus is seated on the throne and we are in Christ, I'm going to go slow so we can get this. If Jesus is seated in the third heaven, if Jesus, Jesus is the highest authority in all of that which is created and all of that which exists, if Jesus, Jesus is the highest authority in the land, he's the highest authority in the heavens, he's the highest authority that there is, he sits on the throne that is above all thrones, and you and I sit in Jesus. Yes, yeah, some people are starting to get the math. You see, Jesus, Jesus had his altar experience. Jesus went through the altar of the cross to take up that place on the throne, the firstborn. He was already God before he went to the cross. But through the altar of the cross, he became the firstborn of sons and daughters, the children of God. He prepared the way. He made the way. He was never born. He's eternally existent. But he was the first to be reborn in this spiritual life, preparing the way and setting the example for you and I. You and I are now to take up the position of worship in the altar around his throne. His throne is seated now in the middle. See, Jesus had to go through the altar to get to the throne. You and I have to go. I hope this math is not too hard. Jesus had to go through the altar to get to the throne. You and I are called to be seated in Christ in the third heaven, in the throne with him, and we have to go through the altar to get there. You and I can go through the altar because he went through the altar. If he hadn't gone through the altar, it wouldn't matter what you and I were doing at the altar. But because he's gone through the altar, we now go through the altar. We take up our place. We go through the most overwhelming circumstances of life, that which seems like it will drown us, that which seems like it's overwhelming, that which seems like it is holding us back and keeping us from the very promises of God, the thing that seems insurmountable. And oh, by the way, it's not just the overflowing river of life that's before us. They're giants on both sides of the river. And it's in the very midst of that 
It, Jesus didn't get the, Joshua didn't get the stones from the bank of the river. He didn't get them from a place that was near the river. He got them from the deepest place in the middle of the river. He said, that is where you get the stone. That is where we find the material for your altar. And through that altar is the place where you come into intimacy. You become one with Jesus. And now you are seated in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus. And where Jesus is seated in the heavenly place is on the throne. This math is not complicated, is it? Okay. So you got it, right? Y'all are either blown away or you have no clue what I'm talking about. I can't tell. You're either like, wow, or you're like, what? I don't know. So all of that, all of that we said to get to this. Here, we're narrowing, 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 narrowing to this point. When you pray. Notice I didn't say if you pray. Um, when you pray. When you pray. When you pray. When you pray. Would you remind your heart and your head and your mouth that you were seated? If you have entered prayer through that altar experience, you have come through the altar, you are seated in Christ Jesus in the heavenly realm. You are in the highest authority, in the highest place, and it is from there that you decree and declare. It is from there that you preach and you pray. I'm glad I'm excited about it. Let me see if I can put it in a way that you understand. When you tell cancer, no, you will stop here. In fact, you will go back to where you came from because I'm in the presence of God. You are speaking and declaring that from the very throne of God, from the highest authority in the land, the highest place in all of creation. You are telling cancer, no, stop, go. When hell comes against you, when it lies to you, when it tells you we're not worthy, you say, no, lie, go back to hell from which you came. I decree and I declare from the highest authority in all of creation, that is not true. I am a child of God. I am a son of God. My identity is found in and through Jesus Christ. I am worthy because he is worthy. I am loved because he is love. When you decree and declare a thing, when you pray, please stop. If you are still going to prayer and you are hoping that something good happens, you are wishing and wanting, you haven't made the heart connection yet. Your head is not where it needs to be. Until we understand that when we enter into prayer, we are the government, we are the authority. You see, the throne of God is the authority. 12 is the number of authority. It is the number of government. This is a governmental issue. The altar is a place of government. You take up your place at the altar to be governing forces in this world. You in the third heaven to rule over the first heaven. Too many Christians, too many believers are walking around letting the first heaven dictate to them, but they are seated in the third heaven. When you go to prayer, it's not hoping something will happen. It is knowing something will happen. You decree and you declare in unwavering faith, hey, I've gone to a prayer meeting, which means I've come to give the devil marching orders today. I've not come to pray in hope that I can say something that will make God's heart move and change the world. God's looking at me going, you're the government that I set in the earth. You're the government that I set in the first heaven. I've given you all of my authority. Now start governing. Start decreeing and declaring what will and will not be. Send forth my word. Manifest my promises. Make a memorial. Build a testimony. Do something that generations will look upon you. Do something that the world will look in and go, oh my, he must know God. Because when he speaks, heaven and earth moves. You should know when you pray that heaven and earth are going to move. You should have the expectation that heaven and earth are going to move. If you're not praying from that place, you're wasting your time. Stop praying and start worshiping. Worship until you are so intimate with God that you know when you pray, stuff happens. And pray until you feel it change. 
Pray until it moves. Don't say a prayer. Throw it out there and hope it happens and walk away and go watch SpongeBob. You get on your face. You get on your knees. You turn on the worship music. And you pray until you know in here and in here that it has happened. Because if he said it, it'll come to pass. And if you were seated in the authority, if you were seated on the throne, in the one who is the highest in the land, and you speak it, you decree it, and you declare it, it shall come to pass. Please, please rise up. May a government of God rise up in the land. May young men and young women, older men and older women rise up in the land who will govern the first heaven, who will govern this earth. You were sent forth to decree and declare, to have dominion, to rule and reign over everything that creeps on this earth. You are not the victim, but you are the victor. You are not the tail but you were the head. You were not called to walk behind, but before. You were not called to walk in poverty, but in prosperity. Call it forth. Yes. Not hoping, knowing, expecting, yes. demanding. Yes. You are in a position in the highest authority in the land that you can demand what will happen.